All right, I think we're good. <clears throat> OK, uh, the chair calls to order the March 22nd meeting of the Kansas Governmental Ethics Commission. Uh, welcome back, commissioners and staff. Uh, my apologies for appearing remotely. I promise by the next one I will be there in person to meet our newest commissioners. Uh, Mark, Chris, Andrew in person. So uh, uh, thanks for the flexibility today. Uh, in your materials, we have today's agenda in the minutes from our meeting on February 22nd. If everyone has had an opportunity to review both the minutes and the agenda, can anyone identify any corrections that need to be made to either? There are none. I will entertain a motion to approve both the agenda and minutes as written. Nick, I, I would make that motion. It's Jane. Thank you, Jane. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, any additional questions? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion to approve the agenda and minutes as written, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, <laughs> say nay. The motion passes. Uh, turning to today's agenda, we will begin with an executive director's report that consists of a legislative update. Uh, Director Skoglin. Sure, I'm happy to provide the legislative update. The primary thing we're talking about, or the only thing we're talking about, because the legislature has yet to adopt any of our recommendations in the last five years, and this year is no different. So this um, today I'm providing an update on what previously was HB 2391, um, and after quite a bit of discussion and negotiation, it is now substitute for SB 208. Um, we've been in um, pretty extensive conversations. We're glad to finally be part of the process um, with We've had a lot of good um, conversations, both with Will Lawrence, the governor's chief of staff, and the authors of the bill as well. Um, we've resulted in what ultimately is this compromise, and I'm going to go through with what is still included in sub for SB 208 um, and how it will change things for the commission. So um, after I get through all of it, obviously feel free to ask any questions. Um, there's a lot of changes. So. The first is that it formally applies um, the Administrative Procedures Act and Civil Procedure. So, uh, um, CAPA has already been persuasive authority for us, and in at least one respect, it is formally applied already. This isn't a big change. It applies the Kansas Judicial Review Act, which already applies to us. It applies the Public Speech Protection Act to anything that we file in district court. Um, we have a five-year statute of limitations on campaign finance matters. Um, no action by the commission can require a respondent to waive civil or legal rights to judicial recourse. It requires the commission to create a regulation that establishes um, essentially what would require a commissioner to recuse themselves from a matter. Um, this is actually something that I had supported from the outset in the initial bill. There's a new definition of agent, which we all agree on. There's a, um, they've, PAC registrations are now tiered to be more in line with, really we're updating it for current practice, but also it, rages, it raises some registration fees as well that haven't been adjusted in quite a while. Um, this is in part, you'll see, we'll talk about it in a minute, but this is in part to give the commission also a little more stable um, funding source for the fee fund as well. Um, legislators who inadvertently solicit lobbyists during session um, for campaign donations is fine as long as they put a disclaimer on the e email indicating they didn't intend for the email to erupt to be sent to a to a lobbyist. Again, this is something I supported in the original bill. Um, it allows using campaign funds for gifts for political office staff if it's otherwise legal. Um, it pays penalties or fines and also allows using your campaign fund to pay legal fees related to campaign finance investigations or enforcement actions. Starting in section six is the changes to subpoenas. Right now, in order to issue a subpoena, the commission must have a three fourths majority of the commission to approve them. And we have to, um, all the people approving the subpoena have to be in physical presence, which means that we all, even in 2023, we all have to drag everyone to Topeka. Um, the bill changes this. Um, this is a good change for us that reduces that threshold to two thirds. Um, so going from seven to six commissioners required to approve a subpoena and removes the physical presence requirement. So we can actually meet like this and still be able to approve subpoenas if necessary. Um, however, once the commission approves a subpoena, we have to file an action in district court to um, essentially to, for a judge to review the subpoenas sufficiency scope um, and reasonableness 
And if the district, we wait for the district court then to issue an order um, to enforce the subpoena, at which point we can send it out. Um, the it also includes that um, anyone subject to a subpoena, you know, witness is, just, um, is provided right to counsel, um, which I feel is something that is not good law, but it is the outcome of the current compromise. It is the intention of the authors, I believe, to echo um, current inquisition standards um, in, in criminal law. I don't think that analogy necessarily applies, but it is the compromise that we arrived at. And I'm, the next section changes our requirement to find probable cause on a complaint from a simple majority to two thirds. It eliminates the requirement to set a hearing within 30 days of finding probable cause. This is actually a technical suggestion that we, a technical legislative recommendation that we included in a cleanup bill um, the last few years. It requires um, the commission um, contract with separate legal counsel if um, on particular matters, if the staff attorney is representing the director or the complainant in the matter. Um, the next is the next very big change, and that's um, anytime a respondent requests hearings can be removed to the Office of Administrative Hearings for an initial order. So the essentially the hearing um, and the facts and the development of evidence is run by the Office of Administrative Hearings. After they've completed the hearing, then it is sent back to the commission for a final determination. The commission may adjust that order as they see fit, but they cannot run an additional hearing on the matter. Um, OAH would then run for, in those instances, they would run pre-hearing as well as hearing, so they'd handle uh, pre-hearing discovery. The final determination is still, however, by the commission. Um, next, it also it in, includes caps on the civil fines that we can issue. Um, the caps are three times of what one violation would be in a particular matter or twice the pecuniary gain for the particular respondent. It moves our fine collections to the state general fund. Um, this is, I think, probably a good change in line with um, our the addition or the changes to PAC registration. It ensures that there isn't a budgetary impact for us. And it provides, like I said, a more stable budget source. Um, it doesn't, it prohibits the commission from ordering community service or other specific performance other than training and anything that's already required under the act, like requiring reports. So we can't reduce a civil fine for uh, other matters outside of training and things that are already required under the Campaign Finance Act. And there are um, the commission can't have legally binding immunity agreements unless criminal immunity is um, provided as well. I can say, certainly take any questions. Um, this is the bill that is likely to, if passed the committee, um, and is likely to pass out on the floor probably tomorrow, I would expect. This is a Ways and Means Committee bill? Um, it, was, it, it was a House elections bill, um, and it will probably be heard on the floor tomorrow. I would but it was preferred to ways to means to, to give it uh, appropriations, allow, but yes, know, or appropriations in order to, uh, to bless the bill essentially right. to allow right. it to have more time for discussion. Do you uh, uh, could you provide us all with a with the outline that you were reading from today, or a copy of the bill? I can give you a copy of the bill and a an outline that doesn't look as bad as the notes that I have in front of me, but I'm happy to provide something like that. Um, also, the authors did draft something that they provided to the committee, the House Elections Committee. I can provide that as well. Um, I don't necessarily agree with every representation in that, but I think it's a relatively accurate representation of what's in the bill. Good enough. I had a question, Mark. Um, the provision about moving the hearings to the administrative hearing um, office. <laughs> Do you know anything more about that recommendation or that piece of the bill? Yes, so essentially what would happen is the, com the commission would run any hearing where a respondent doesn't request moving it to OAH. So most hearings about um, things like just not filing a report are probably still going to end up with the commission, though obviously we have to file, follow CAPA, CIPPRO, typical administrative procedure. Um, however, if a respondent requests that the Office of Administrative Hearings hear the matter instead, then at that point the matter would be removed to OAH. They would run the hearing essentially. Um, they would do all pre hearing discovery, they would do all of those matters. Um, at the conclusion, they would have an initial order, which would include what they believe the out, whether or not a violation exists and whether what assessment they believe is necessary. That would come to the commission for adjustment and final determination as needed, um, if needed. 
which may not be the case in many instances. Um, so some hearings will end up going over to a different agency um, to handle. And this is not necessarily atypical in some agencies. It has not been the historical practice of the commission, obviously. Um, I would have preferred that the agency keep its hearings, but um, I, that said, I think that it's this bill ultimately does represent a negotiated compromise on many procedural items. I, just, I thought that was interesting, so thank you. Any other uh, questions or comments for Mark? Um, and if you want, yeah. Sorry. Uh, we will uh, continue back to the agenda if there are no questions or comments. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, the next item on the agenda is civil penalties, and there are a number to discuss. Uh, Mark? Take a deep breath. It's March, which means the January penalty or the January report penalties that um, are hit the maximum typically get assessed in March. That's what's happening today. So first is the January 10th report. Um, all of these, if I unless I say otherwise, have been assessed the maximum penalty. Um, George Arlen Briggs, Brett Charbonneau, Scott Hamblin, Taisha Nichols, Bob Reese, Marsha Reese, Faith Rivera, Justin Spees, um, a, um, a local candidate, was assessed 160. Daniel Stillwell, Sam Stillwell, Melvin Williams, Ann Zajic, and Harold Zajic. On the next page are parties and packs. Again, unless I say otherwise, they are assessed the maximum $300 penalty for the January 10th report. Danielle Barton, Tiffany Havener, uh, Sandra Hill, Haley Kotler, Steve Lopes, Steve Lopez was assessed $280. Richard Ramos, Justin Shore was assessed $280. Trace Waugh, Sandra Hill, Tyler Turns was assessed $20 for an amended July and October receipts and expenditures report. Um, Tad Lawrenson was assessed 20 for an amended 2022 PAC registration. Next page is lobbyist civil penalties. The first one is Mackenzie Haddock's. We're going to skip, um, uh, even though this is just providing notice to the commission, I'm actually going to skip that one. They've, uh, she has counsel and we'll talk about, and I imagine we'll submit a waiver request, but wanted to discuss it later. And so we're delaying sending the letter. Uh, Dan Drew Herbert um, for 1,000, Allison Hilton for 750. Elizabeth Lewis for thousand, Marlene Vincent for thousand, Stephanie Yeager for three fifty. Um, for the March report, um, Ward Cassidy for a hundred dollars. That's all the civil penalty um, assessments for this meeting. There's no um, motion that is necessary because they happen automatically by operation of statute. Okay, thank you, um, <clears throat> Director Scoglin. Do any commissioners have any questions about any of the civil penalties that? Director Scoglin has just taken us through. Um, if there are no uh, comments or questions, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is civil penalty waiver requests. And I see that we have six. We do. The first is Saul Delgado Anaya. Um, the this person was um, a party committee treasurer and was assessed three hundred dollars for late filing of a report. They were assessed in January. They have not previously received a penalty. Um, they um, indicate in their letter the categories that we're applying here are typically that they did resign and they are indicating financial hardship and the ability to pay as well. Um, I think they also more or less take responsibility as well um, to for the late filing of the report. I do not have a recommendation on this item. It doesn't cleanly fall into one of the categories that we indicate one way or the other. Do any commissioners wish to make a motion? I would move we waive. Jerry, uh, thank you. Uh, the motion on the table is to waive uh, in full. Is that correct, Jerry? Correct. Um, do any commissioners wish to second that motion? I'll second it. Thank you, John. Um, any additional discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed say nay. 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 So let's uh, take a roll count. Uh, Jerry, you're a, an aye. Yes. Uh, Commissioner Solbach. 
Aye. Uh, Jane? Nay. Uh, Kyle? Aye. Patty? Aye. Uh, uh, Commissioner Shonifer? Nay. Uh, Commissioner Berger? Nay. Uh, Commissioner Harrison? Aye. Aye. Okay, the ayes have it. Um, the next item on the agenda is Allison Hilton. Um, Allison Hilton was a registered lobbyist. Um, she indicated that she was relatively inactive. This is another one of those situations that we occasionally see in lobbying where they changed employers and the previous employer did not contact her when we sent the notices to her. Um, we do also communicate through email, but obviously some we send many communications through email, but frequently their email uh, does not transfer to the next um, employer. We don't know if it did or not in this instance. Um, we will say that once she became aware of it, she did file immediately, which we do typically consider. She was assessed $750 in um, at this meeting. This is her first civil penalty. Um, again, none of the uh, the categories that typically are um, things we look at very strongly apply, so I have no recommendation on this item. Hey, Mark, this is Mark Schonifer. Um, hey. Stated that she did file immediately when she became aware, but I'm reading in this letter, she actually wrote, but I did not want to honor my responsibility to register due to some of my interactions. Is she talking about registering when she said she didn't want to honor responsibility? Yeah, she says, I did want to honor my responsibility to register due to some of my interactions. I think she's implying that she did not think she probably had to legally register as a lobbyist, um, but did so just out of, an, uh, out of an intention to be transparent and make sure she is complying with the law. I'm unsure because I don't know of her activity, um, whether or not she actually would have had to register or not. Um, I most of these instances, the answer is yes, they probably did need to register, but I don't know with her specifically. Okay. So it sounds like there was, um, I don't know, maybe some hard feelings there that entered in her, in her, entered into her decision making rather than I wasn't aware. My Mark, but yes, I have, I have no recommendation on this item. Director Scoglin, tell us again uh, what the money at issue is. 750. The maximum lobbyist penalty for one report is a thousand, so she was assessed seven fifty. Um, the way lobbyist penalties are calculated we, um, is that the first day they are after it, we send a failure to file, there's a two day grace period. After um, after that, the first day they are late is a hundred dollars, and then it's fifty dollars every day up to a thousand dollars. She was assessed seven hundred and fifty dollars. Uh, in considering the letter and uh, the remarks from Director Scoglund, are there any commissioners that wish to make a motion to waive in full or to waive in part? If there are none, we will move on. The next is Steve Lopez. He does not have a writing in front of you. This is because he was assessed $280 and has since deceased. Um, I would request an administrative waiver uh, for Mr. Lopez and his estate. So moved. Second. Thank you, Jerry. Who was our second? Burger. OK, thank you, Chris. Um, no any additional discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion to waive, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion passes. The next is Jordan Metcalf, who has a pretty lengthy waiver request um, by our standards, um, about a page and a half. Um, this was a person who was a candidate for state office, was assessed $600 um, in January. This is their first civil penalty. Um, there's a number of categories that apply to this waiver request. They were a write-in candidate, and typically the commission historically is a bit more understanding of write-in candidates since they are not formally filed for office, but they do still they count as candidates under the Campaign Finance Act for all purposes. When they did file their report, it was they filed zeros. They did not take in or expend any money. They indicate in the writing accordingly that they were an inactive candidate. They do appear to own the the um, violation that that they understand the issue. And they indicate that they believe it's large. The six hundred dollars is larger than is necessary to deter a violation. Which, after talking to our state campaign finance desk, 
I think, agrees in this particular instance. In light of the fact primarily that it's a write-in candidate who filed zeros, I would recommend at least a partial waiver, um, and um, that would I will leave it at that. Uh, out of curiosity, what was it? What was he running for? What office? State representative. Okay. Yeah. No, I think sorry. he was a late breaking rate write-in candidate. And uh, to be clear, he's inactive now. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, do any commissioners wish to make a motion to waive or to uh, partially waive or? Do any commissioners have any questions? In view of the fact, go ahead, I'm sorry. In view of the fact that he took in zero and was a write-in, said that he get, what, didn't even run long enough to run ads on Facebook, it seems maybe like he actually says in the last sentence of his, his uh, uh, letter to you that uh, $600 is dispor disproportionate to the harm done by his oversight. I, I would have to agree with that. I, I would move for you know, maybe to reduce the penalty to a hundred bucks. Yeah, that uh, that that is the motion. And is there any kind of temporal uh, if paid within 30 days or uh, I mean, that's sometimes what's traditionally done. Yeah, I think that that makes sense. Uh, so that that would be my motion. I would second that. This is Kyle. Thank you, Kyle. The motion is to uh, reduce the uh, penalty to $100, provided it is paid within 30 days. Uh, are there any comments or questions before we vote on the seconded motion? Uh, hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion passes. Uh, next is Marlene Vincent. She's a lobbyist who was assessed the maximum $1,000 penalty. She was assessed just now at this meeting. She has not received a previous penalty. Um, this, so this is her first late fee. Um, this is a waiver request that is a little odd for me because it falls into a category that she probably did not actually need to register. And the commission typically does provide waivers in this instance. However, I will note that she indicated we send uh, and by we, I mean our extremely active lobbying desk sends numerous email reminders both in advance and after the deadline um, for lobbyists who, uh, as reminders. Um, and the she indicated on the phone to her apparently that she ignored those emails because she did not think she needed to file. Um, so normally I would recommend a waiver here um, because she does not, she doesn't need to register, but I always have a little bit of a hard time when someone has actively um, ignored co attempted communications from our office. So I will leave it at no recommendation and just note that the historical practice often, but not always, is to provide waivers in instances where someone probably did not actually need to register as a lobbyist. Could you say more about that? Why they would not have to? Yes, so it's someone, their writing I think explains it um, pretty well, but essentially this is someone who was told by someone else outside of our office that they thought that they needed to register. Um, she, because of her activity, she wasn't actually engaging in lobbying. In order to register to be someone who has to register as a lobbyist, two things have to be true. One, you have to be engaged in lobbying, which is extremely broad. It's promoting or opposing in any matter legislative action. Um, but you also have to be fit into the narrow definition of a lobbyist, which is there's four categories. Typically, one of two apply. It's either you are employed to a considerable degree to lobby, which is what I think 90 to 95 percent of our lobbyists are registered under, or you are formally appointed by an organization to lobby. There's a couple other categories. If you spend over a thousand dollars, or if you're um, an independent lobbyist for uh, an agency, but typically those don't apply as much as the first two. So her um, impression here is that she probably did not fit into those categories. And based on my understanding, I think that's probably accurate. I have no reason to doubt that representation. Um, and so she may not have needed to register at all. Um, she has, however, kept her registration today. She did not terminate, but she's filing affidavits. So she's maintaining that she will remain a registered lobbyist, but will um, not spend any money, essentially. And what is the uh, fine amount at issue? $1,000, the maximum. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we uh, 
waive her fee if she pays one hundred dollars within thirty days. Or waive her fine if she yes. pays one hundred dollars, it would be thirty days. Similar to the last one, so fine reduced to one hundred dollars, provided it is paid within thirty days. Right. Do any commissioners wish to second that motion? I would second it. This is Mark Shonifer. Thank you, Commissioner Shonifer. Uh, do uh, any other do any commissioners have any questions? I, I, I would have a counter motion, which would or substitute motion, substitute but or, or at least just or an amendment or just notifying that I would vote against this because as someone who is not falling under the jurisdiction, I don't think they should be penalized, even if they were to willfully say we're not going to respond. So with someone who is, you know, we don't have jurisdiction over, but they voluntarily mistakenly said, maybe we do, then um, I give it within their rights to say no to, to that. So I, I, that's why I would vote against the 100. Okay. And just ask me, you, you, know, you just, uh, why don't you just make a substitute motion to waive the whole thing? Well, I think it's, I think there's one which is pending before everyone though. Excuse me? Yeah. There's a pending motion. Well, you can make a substitute to, to that motion. Well, that would require who was our second as well. Well, um, Mark was. Mark. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you know, I, I, won't, it, I won't bother with that if everyone gives me like a, a sticky would, eye or something like that. It wouldn't require a second, <laughs> my second to approve of it. You just make a substitute motion. That is a substitute motion. I believe that if, uh, if uh, Commissioner Shonifer, if you would favor that, motion or uh, Commissioner Solbach, if you would favor that motion, you can both withdraw your motions or we can take a vote on your motion. I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. Well, then I would so move to to um, have any sort of penalty waived with regard to this individual. I would second. OK, so the motion yeah. now is for a complete waiver, and that is uh, <clears throat> Uh, firsted by uh, by Jerry or by Chris and seconded by Jerry. Yeah, I have a point of discussion first. So as a lobbyist, one of the categories of being a lobbyist is that you're contracted by a company to perform the duties of or to advocate for their lobby, right? Uh, you have to be employed to a considerable degree to lobby. OK, and well, here mostly established through 1970s era opinions of the commission. This lady says that she was the shadow of Shana, a lobbyist from our company. I mean, obviously, we don't know whether it's a, to a considerable degree, but I would make the point that it does seem like she may be employed by this term limits advocacy organization. I would say that just again, I don't have uh, we didn't. It's not like we have an in-depth investigations into penalty waivers. Um, my understanding is that she is indicating in the waiver request that she was not engaged in lobbying, um, and that's not why she is perhaps employed or related to the organization. She may have. Yes. So uh, and I don't have any indication that she did promote or oppose anything. She may have been present in the room. She may have actually had those conversations. But I don't know of any reason to believe at this point that she is employed to a considerable degree to lobby. And um, again, I don't oppose either of the previous motions for sure. I think they're both entirely reasonable approaches. Good question. Mm -hmm. Noted. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Commissioner Harrison. Uh, we will just go ahead and take a vote on the motion. All in favor of approving the motion for a complete waiver signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. Aye. Nay. Noted Jane. Uh, thank you. Uh, the motion passes. Uh, the remaining item is um, a Bridget Williams. Bridget Williams is a lobbyist who was assessed $300 in January. Um, this is not the individual's first penalty. They were assessed $1,000 in June 2022. They did not request a waiver at that time and they paid that in October. Um, the waiver request more or less indicates some confusion about registration versus deadlines. They essentially said um, that when they registered for this year in January, they thought that that would cover the last the reporting requirement of the last three months of 2022. Um, historically, the commission is not particularly generous on waiver requests that focus on confusion about registration and deadlines, especially in light of the number of attempts that we had that we engage into 
um, remind them of their obligations, I would recommend no waiver in this matter. Mm -hmm. This is a focused pack as well. Yeah, this is their disc. Yes, though I will note that um, this is a, this is part of what I think is causing some of the problem here um, for them is that they have a pack, and this is also this particular penalty is for her activity as a lobbyist. Um, she operates in both universes, which does create some interesting uh, turn uh, overlap. January tenth is the day that every single person in the entire world who has any office of any account open with. Uh, the Kansas Governmental Ethics Commission has to file a report. So. <laughs> and uh, are there any questions or uh, do any commissioners wish to make a motion? If there are none, we will move on. OK, uh, turning back to the agenda, we have executive session and uh, <clears throat> You should have received your executive session materials. Uh, Mark, how much, or excuse me, Director Scoglin, how much time do you believe we'll need? Uh, it's short. Um, let's say, let's say, ten minutes. Okay. Let's uh, let's say one forty-two. Uh, Commissioner Kroll, if you could do us the honors. I do. Uh, we do not have Brett Barry, so. Justification for executive session is meeting with or having present staff. Which motion do you have in front of you? Uh, I have, I, I didn't receive one with the packet, so I'm looking at the minutes from the last go around. And uh, in that one, it was to discuss potential litigation with the attorney. Litigation is the one we want. Litigation is the. Okay is the uh, motion so yes. uh, brett barry will not be present correct that is correct hold on one second and will you be the only staff member uh, mark actually actually it's going to be my recommendation that we do not recess into executive session at all because without brett barry present we cannot have attorney client um, as a coma exception so I don't think that we legally can um, with uh, enter into executive session at this time. I think the only remaining action would be to declare the next meeting and adjourn. OK, um, any any comments or questions just about that line of thinking from any of the commissioners? Because it sounds sound to me. OK, thank you, um, Director Scoglin, and thank you, uh, Commissioner Krull. So turning back to the agenda, I see that we uh, anticipate skipping the month of April with our next meeting scheduled for uh, nine weeks from now on May 24th. Is that correct? Yes, it's possible that we try to have an April meeting earlier in the month, depending on everyone's schedule. Um, I'll send something out to try to get something scheduled if that we think that's something necessary or beneficial. Um, however, we do often um, have a meeting around this time that occasionally gets canceled uh, and I am rather unlikely to be present um, with a newborn at home. So uh, at the at least for our normally scheduled meeting. So yes, the next regularly scheduled meeting would not be until May as long as the commission is OK with that. Is this a, a newborn that has occurred or a newborn that's going to occur? Uh, going to occur. Due date is April 16th. Mm -hmm. Excellent news, uh, Mark. Um, do any commissioners have any uh, comments, questions, anything else to bring before the commission before we adjourn today? Well, do keep us posted, Mark. Oh, I'll send pictures as soon as I have enough sleep to remember to send pictures. <laughs> All right, thanks. <laughs> All right, and uh, in a similar vein, as you know, wishing you well, Mark. We also uh, wish Brett a speedy recovery. So. Um, I will. Can I uh, get a motion to adjourn? Well, one thing before we do that, just a, a question on the executive session materials. Do we roll those forward or should we feed those to the shredder? I would shred them. OK. All right. Great. Um, so yeah, we just simply need to adjourn now, so I will take a motion. So I would make that motion. Thank you, Sorry. Kyle. Do I have a second? Second. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any additional discussion? 
Hearing none, all in favor of approving the motion to adjourn signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed say nay. The motion passes. This adjourns the uh, March 22nd meeting of the Kansas Governmental Ethics Commission. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, thank you, staff, uh, particularly Paige, filling in for Barbara. And, and thank you, as always, Director Scoglin. So we will look forward to uh, either hearing from you in the event that we need to uh, partake in, a, in, a, in another meeting, or we will just plan to see you on, on in May. So thank you very thank much you for everyone. seeing all of you. Thank you. And again, yes, thanks to Paige for filling in and doing such a great job. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. 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 Thanks, bu